can put in a ton of staples without worrying if the block is going to split. So here we have a 14 inch long block. That's what you normally work with in seismic retrofitting shear walls. And then we have 63 staples and it can resist 5,600 5, uh, pounds of lateral force, which is what earthquakes resist. So this, you know, this, all these staples can resist anything you want. You don't have to worry about splitting. It's an absolutely fabulous way of making uh, these types of connections. Staples also work quite well when we're using a system that the American Plywood Association calls the reverse block method. Let me show you how that works. So here we have our piece of plywood and then this is a 2x4. So what we've done here is we put the 2x4 next to the plywood and then we nail the piece of plywood to the back edge of the 2x4. Then we take that whole assembly and we put it down right here and then along here we either nail or we staple this 2x4 into the mud sill right here. So what you find in all these old houses is this will be a full four inches, this will be a full six inches, so you have two inches from the face of the stud to the edge of the mud sill. So here's a situation under a typical crawl space here in the San Francisco Bay Area where a reverse block method shear wall would be very effective. So here you can see that the mud sill, that is a full six inches. And this right here, this is the stud, and that's four inches. So we have two inches right here where we can put a, uh, a reverse block. Now notice that the bolts are inside the uh, stud cavities. So here we've got a bolt here and a bolt here and a bolt you know, back in here, which means when we put the, lay the two by four flat along the mud sill right here, uh, we don't have to worry about the bolts because they're right behind our reverse block shear wall. So this is a pretty effective way to build a retrofit shear wall and one that we use quite often. Now we need to see if the reverse block system will work from an engineering point of view. There's a document called the National Design Specification and it's part of the building code. And what it does is it tells us how far apart nails and staples can be from each other in order to maintain their effectiveness, how far from the edges of wood, how wood species impacts them, uh, how far from the edges. It tells us everything there is to know about you know, using staples and nails. And we need to know that to figure out whether or not this system is going to be effective. Now this uh, table right here that you see on the upper left, that has to do with nails. But a staple is simply a smaller nail. So here you'll see a 10 penny nail and that is a 0.148 thousandth of an inch and a staple is simply, a 15 gauge staple is simply half of that, a 0.27 inches. So basically, you know, uh, each leg of a staple is basically half of a nail. Um, just looking at the diameters. So let's go ahead and see what these are. So the edge distance right here, 2.5D, that stands for diameters. That means from the edge distance is from the edge of the 2x4 right here to the edge of the fastener. So it either the staple or the nail. So 2.5 diameters with a 10 penny nail is about 3 8 of an inch. With a staple, it's about 3 16 of an inch. Uh, those are the edge distances that we need to maintain. Now right here, you'll see the end distance. So this is end distance right here. And that means from the end of the 2x4, and here's our end right here at the end. So here, right here, we can be 15 diameters. And that's, you know, about 2 and a quarter inches right here. And then it says right here that the spacing between fasteners in a row can also be 15 diameters, and that's about two and a quarter inches. So what it's saying here is we can put a, you know, nails here, we can go two and a quarter, 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 so long as we maintain the edge distances and the end distances that are here in the natural design specification. So this right here, we have to be really careful because this edge right here, which if you follow this yellow line, the edge of the mud sill is right below that. We have to worry about that edge as well. So the edge that is underneath this two by four, which is equivalent to that, we have to make sure that our nails are in our staples uh, maintain their edge distances from here, you know, from, from the edge of that uh, mud sill. 
So we have an inch and a half to work with. So if we're using a nail, we come here, we go three eighths of an inch from that edge. And you know what we would do where that yellow line is because that represents the edge of the mudsill below it. We can also go three eighths of an inch from here. And then we can put nails right in the middle pretty much anywhere we want. Now with staples, we can go 3 sixteenths of an inch from here on the edge, 3 sixteenths of an inch from the edge of the mud sill, which again, it runs all the way down this way uh, underneath the yellow line. And so long as we keep those edge distances, we'll be in good shape. Right now, we're going to be watching a technician install a reverse block shear wall with staple. <laughs> Good idea. This demonstration shows how amazing staples are. These staples here are half an inch to uh, one inch apart with absolutely no problem with splitting. Could have put them even closer than that. Staples, they just don't split wood. And it's uh, very, very handy. Right now we're going to go ahead and put staples into the narrow face of the 2x4 and see how many staples we can get in there and how close they can be because that's where we can actually staple plywood to the framing and we might be able to get some very very high capacity shear walls in that way <laughs> So here you can see staples that have been put a quarter of an inch to a half an inch apart. And as you can see, there have been no, no problems with uh, splitting. So the staples are really amazing when they go into the narrow face of a two by four. You can really do a lot. Now, maybe I just didn't know better. I mean, from what I read in all the tables at the American Plywood Association and so forth and other tests, the closest they'd ever done, I believe, was inch and a half or two inches. I just didn't know any better. But I went ahead and tried it anyway, and man, you can really get staples very, very close together. And I always wondered, how strong can you make a sure wall? This letter dates all the way back to, I believe, 2003 when I was on an International Code Council Committee writing seismic retrofit guidelines for the San Francisco Bay Area. And as a committee member, I contacted the uh, American Plywood Association because they are the lead research facility for shear walls in the country. And I asked them to evaluate the four methods that we had developed uh, in my company. And so you can see here that the reverse block method is, uh, is highly you know, recommended, as is the stapled uh, blocking method if you happen to use uh, fasteners. In other words, if you're going to use fasteners, use staples uh, rather than nails. Now, unfortunately, the flush cut method, the saws are no longer available, so this is no longer a viable strategy. But I think this letter uh, lends good support to the case that I've been making here that a reverse block method with staples uh, is a very good alternative. In some situations, we must staple plywood directly to the subfloor, and this is a case in point right here. So the problem was that we could not access a mud sill. You can see right in here, maybe the concrete was all the way up to the floor, you know, whatever the reason is, but we could not access a mud sill to do, uh, use any conventional methods. So what we've done is we've taken this wood member right here, and we attached this piece of plywood to it. So what we did is we nailed it right, nailed the two together right here where that seam is. And then we bolted this wood member here and then here. And then we pushed that up against the floor and then we stapled it to attach the plywood to the uh, subfloor. This isn't something that we do uh, very often, but when you need to do it, it, this is the only way you can do it. So here is a construction detail that illustrates exactly what we saw in the photograph uh, just now. And in this particular situation, the problem was that the distance between the edge of the sill and the edge of the concrete exceeded two and a half inches. 
Now, the reason that's a problem is the standardized hardware called the Simpson URFP has a uh, maximum uh, edge distance of two and, a, two and a half inches. So if we were less than two and a half inches, we could have used that hardware, but we can't in this situation. So that's why this particular detail was developed, because sometimes that happens. Now, it also would have uh, been the case, if, let's say that this mud sill was embedded in the concrete, and sometimes that happens. In other words, this mud sill, rather than being here, it would have been an embedded in the concrete right there. And in that case, the subfloor would have been sitting straight on top of the foundation, and there would be no access to the sill. And without this particular construction detail, uh, you would never be able to attach the floor to the foundation. When working with staples, it's very important to know if the wood is pressure treated or not. And let me show you why. This is a screw, and as you can see, the screw is completely disappeared. A little bit of it is left right here, but the pressure treated wood pretty much disintegrated the entire screw. And this is a very corrosive wood that's called ACQ. And then you come over here and you see the exact same thing. This is some uh, galvanized steel and it was up against some pressure treated wood. It did get some moisture and it caused you know, pretty much the disintegration of this, of this piece of steel. So it's a serious problem. Uh, this, these pressure treated woods are very corrosive and you gotta be very, very careful about using them. Now pressure treated wood often looks like this right here. You know, it's, it's brown or it's green and has these incisions. So you'll see these uh, marks here which is where they, uh, they cut into the wood when they applied the preservative. So they injected it into the wood through those, you know, through those incisions right there. So um, if you have any doubt whether or not a wood is pressure treated, uh, always be safe and use, a, use stainless steel staples. So as you can see right here from the International Building Code, which is also part of the California Building Code, staples shall be of stainless steel. So that's pretty clear. Uh, no matter what, if you're going to pressure treated wood, always use stainless steel staples. Right now we're going to look at some tests that were done previously. We're going to be looking at APA Research Report 154 and some testing that was done at the University of Utah in 2008. The American Plywood Association conducted some tests on staples shear walls and they are found in APA Research Report 154 Table 3 and we're going to be looking at that table right now. We're only going to be looking at the uh, tests that involve very, very close spacing of staples because we want to see how much uh, capacity can we get out of a stapled shear wall. And this is important because sometimes in a seismic retrofit, you have very, very limited amount of wall to work with. So for example, let's say there's a house you're working on and you know it's 24 feet long, 18 uh, feet of that is taken up by the porch meaning there's, there's no foundation there and the there's only you know six feet left and you want to get as much capacity as you possibly can in that limited amount of uh, wall length so that's why we're only going to be looking at the uh, close spacings so let's go ahead and see how you read this table the first thing that we learn is that this is going to be structural one plywood that's a special type of plywood made for shear walls and then this tells us that the staples are two inches apart on the outside edges, 12 inches apart everywhere else, and the length of the staple is inch and a half. So it's inch and a half long, and then the thickness of the plywood is half inch, number of tests is one, and then we come over here, and this is the ultimate load, 1,290. And what that means is that's the point at which the uh, test specimen completely failed. I mean, you would look at it and go, man, this thing is, you know, this thing is trash. It can't resist anything anymore. So that is the point of failure. Now, this number right here is called the allowable value. It's, you know, it's called target design shear, but it's another name is allowable value. And what that means is they say, well, you know what? If someone buys some plywood and it's defective and they don't install it quite correctly and the building inspector doesn't do what he's supposed to, do, you know, supposed to do, you know, if we just factor in all those may might go wrong things we can count on to resist 480 pounds uh, per linear foot even though the test shows it's considerably more so that's what the allowable value is so that's the one we always look at now if we come over to this one even though it's a smaller number a 14 gauge staple is larger than a 16 gauge staple so in this case the staple is an inch and a half 
uh, spacing. So these were two inches apart. These are inch and a half apart. These were the staples were 12 inches apart everywhere except on the edges. And this one is six inches. And this one is quite a bit different here because the staples were two and three quarters inches long. Uh, you know, that's a pretty long staple compared to the inch and a half. And then this plywood is actually thinner than the half inch. And then if we look over here at the, uh, at the you know, these are the two, the two tests. One test was for this ultimate lobe is this much, other test was this much. The average was this much. That's uh, 3,666. And we know this very large number, 1,625. Now, what we need to look at is that footnote there. And the footnote says that this is for a double shear wall. In other words, there's the staple, you know, there's the, the structural one plywood is on one side and it's also on the other side, so it's a double. So to figure it out for one side, you have to divide that by two. And so this, uh, this configuration of staples and plywood can resist around 800 pounds per linear foot uh, compared to the 480 here. So let's look at the, what the things that were different here and that made it stronger. So the 3 8 you know, that certainly didn't make it stronger. You'd think it'd be the other way around. The, the, that the thinner the plywood, the weaker it would be. Now, this made a big difference, I believe, two and three quarters, because elsewhere in the test, it says that the failure of these uh, of the shear walls was faster withdrawal. And so the deeper the staple in the framing, the harder it is to withdraw. So that's certainly going to be one big factor. And then over here, we have the uh, staples were an uh, inch and a half apart instead of two. And that would also make a difference because naturally, the, you know, the closer they are together, the more staples you have. And then, there, and then also that, uh, uh, that also increases withdrawal resistance simply because you have more staples. Another factor is the fact that the 14 gauge staple is you know, bigger than the 16 gauge staple. Then the other uh, staple we're going to look at is the 15 gauge staple. Now the 15 gauge staple in this case is in rated sheathing. Rated sheathing is a little bit weaker than uh, structural one. In this case, the staples are put three inches on the edges and six inches everywhere else. And the length of the staples, like the first test, are inch and a half. And then the thickness is half inch. And we come over here and we end up with an ultimate load of 1,305. And the allowable value they're giving here is 405, which is, you know, which is considerably less than what we have up here. So um, the big factor here is naturally going to be the spacing. So here you've come over here and look here. We only have three inches apart here. We have two inches apart and then we have inch and a half apart. So it looks like the spacing makes a big difference. So we have spacing here. You know, it's really strong spacing here is, you know, is, 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 is better. And then the spacing here is worse. So that seems to be making a big difference as well as as the uh, length of the fastener. Now, this is confirmed in report itself where it says faster withdrawal it was the big problem. And there are also some tests that were done at the University of Utah that also confirmed this. So this is how you read these tables. And I would say this table actually gives us more questions than it does answers. And from a seismic retrofit point of view, we need you know more information than what we have here as we just saw in some tests that you know i did myself um, we can go a lot closer with our staples if we want to and not worry about splitting so i'd like to see some tests where they do uh you know maybe one inch uh, on edges and two or three inches in the field with some staples that are two inches long or even two and a half inches long and do some real tests and see what uh, what would happen if we really tighten up the uh, spacing of the staples. Very similar tests were done at the University of Utah in 2008, and their conclusion was pretty much the same, that the predominant failure mode was staple withdrawal. As we just saw, staples can be a very effective way to attach blocking to mud sills as well as build shear walls. Mm -hmm.